<laughs> I love the farm. <laughs> When I was in a medical school, I used to see how the patients are treated and how they are cared of. And um, I always used to think, can't we do something better? I'm Dipograz Busal, uh, son of my father, Mr. Churamani Busal. And he is suffering from lung cancer the last few months, three, four months. Uh, we are from uh, far away from here in Kathmandu. Previously and when there was no idea about the palliative care, most of the patients died uh, with the suffering, lots of suffering, and their symptoms were poorly managed. There is many challenges in society, in, uh, in emotional thinking, that uh, being uh, having suffering from cancer is not a simple thing. Yeah? Uh, some people in our society still think that being uh, I mean, uh, suffering from cancer is not good. This is due to the result of negative during previous life. When there were no separate uh, hospital for the cancer, so individual department, either it's medicine, surgery, or skyny, individual department used to look after those patients under their department, and they used to treat accordingly. So whenever possible, or to what extent they could treat the patient, they will treat the patient and if they couldn't either they will give the option to the family member we are trying let's try more or do you want to take them to a higher center this was the scenario even sometimes the people have died in the course of treatment in the hospital itself and uh, there was a dreadful deaths we have seen Sometime I think in 2006, Dr. Stuart Brown from INCTR asked me to go to Nepal to help out with some teaching. So I went along with um, Stuart Brown and Fraser Black and a few other people and we um, helped out with a few lectures in Kathmandu and visited a number of beginning palliative care programs in 
uh, Nepal, Hospice Nepal in Kathmandu, and it was a very interesting experience for me. It was um, my first chance to work in a situation like that. There were some very interesting things that um, really struck me and made me think for a long time after I came home. One of the issues in particular was seeing the patients who had pretty difficult symptom issues, pain and nausea, uh, other symptoms, and recognizing that there were good solutions to these problems, but they simply couldn't afford them. One particular example was a man who had very difficult and persistent nausea and vomiting, and uh, we asked whether he, they had tried a simple drug like haloperidol, which we knew was available and we knew was quite inexpensive and they commented that the patient and his family couldn't afford the medication. So we asked how much the medication cost and they, there was a pharmacist in the group and they conferred with the pharmacist and he said the medication would cost five cents. So we, it was really a, a surprise to realize that when they would say this family has no money, they really meant this family has absolutely no money. So when I came home, I, I told that story to a number of people, including my wife Deirdre and some of the nurses in the palliative care unit, and the, the common response of everybody was, well, we have to do something. So we, we had a lot of discussions about how we might be able to help with that and came up with the idea of uh, setting up a partnership between our local palliative care community and a palliative care community in Nepal. The next year, um, we talked to different members of our local palliative care community, including nurses in the hospital palliative care unit, um, community nursing, um, and uh, importantly, the volunteer organization in Nanaimo, the Nanaimo Community Hospice, about forming a partnership with a group in Nepal. So the following year, a few of us went from here, including my wife Deirdre, Dr. Jeff Spry, and a few other people, um, to investigate that more thoroughly and to talk to the Nepalis about that. And one day, that is, that was four years back, we happened to meet Dr. Love through INCTR when we decided that uh, we'll do something to in this hospital. They said that they want to help us in this uh, interview. And uh, we, you know, we had some criteria in mind, but in the end it ended up just being a matter of walking through the doors that opened for us. and. Um, Meeting Dr. Sudeep just felt like the right connection at the time. At that time on Wars, we moved ahead and now we have our separate palliative care service in our hospital. Uh, Bhaktapur Cancer Hospital, along with the collaboration with the Nanaimo Hospital, the, there has been a palliative ward in this hospital and now people and we professional workers are being introduced towards uh, this kind of care and I think it is an initiation and we'll go further tomorrow. We certainly have seen some progress. The physicians and staff are more comfortable prescribing morphine and other strong pain medications. They're putting more emphasis on symptom assessment and symptom management. In the Vaktapur hospital, their symptoms are being, um, most, the, most of their symptoms are being uh, well managed, like pain. Pain is the most common and it's very severe symptom that is being suffered by the dying patient and it has been well managed in the hospital. A lot of the teaching is at the bedside, seeing patients and discussing cases and doing old-fashioned clinical bedside teaching. We've also done some formal lecturing over the years. Uh, they'll ask us to do different lectures while we're there uh, to the larger hospital community. This past year we did helped out with a more formal course. They organized a two week long uh, palliative care course and invited people from the rest of Nepal to come. There were 47 participants, mostly nurses, but about seven physicians as well. Dr. Chadani Vadya has been designated as a the full-time palliative care physician there, that's a very encouraging step to see one of their physicians really taking this on as a personal project to improve the care of the dying people in their palliative care unit. We have been trained by Nanaimo Hospice Society in time to time and also I am very grateful to Nanaimo Community Hospice Society that they provide us a lot of phones so that we can got training from the abroad. We've uh, assisted them in training some of their nurses. We've uh, sponsored Dr. Vadya and the head nurse Lakshmi Shrestha 
and two of the uh, nurses from the palliative care unit, we've helped to send them to Hyderabad in India to take a month-long palliative care course. So that we gain much more knowledge about the palliative care and we can implement this learning, this knowledge in our area or in our hospital. So that I think that we are very confident in handling the case and giving them much more comfort than the previous. More and more patients uh, reaching for the service, uh, they have realized that we should extend our service, we should uh, develop more infrastructure, and this have realized the need of uh, building the, the uh, partnership or uh, seeking help. Um, very nice to see them taking pride in their unit, taking pride in the work that they're doing, uh, and encouraging other people to continue with a similar kind of work of caring for dying people. And we have already formed uh, one palliative care association in Nepal, which has named NAP Care. At the same time, different uh, hospice, uh, hospice movement and palliative care movement has uh, taken place in different uh, cancer hospitals and other hospice, hospices. I want to add some points that and patients and patient parties' points towards the palliative care also uh, changing. Whatever they think before, and now their concept also being changed. As medicine is always uh, dynamic things, we have to learn many, many aspects. And with Nanaimo, we have a lot of palliative expert. I myself is only the medical oncologist, but I have now a lot of expert from Nanaimo Hospice. They come here all the way and we discuss difficult cases and uh, in a different level, not only for patient care, for policy making, for academic teaching and uh, setting up palliative care. All these things has re re really given me and personally I have benefited a lot. Well, from the beginning we were determined that we wanted to do this project properly. And we had concerns about um, this being, we didn't want it to be just a tourist project where we would do volunteer tourism, go to Nepal, have a holiday, and do a little bit of medical work. So we spent quite a bit of time talking to friends that we knew who were involved in palliative care in the developing world, particularly Dr. Raja Gopal from India, who gave us some good advice. Um, one of the important questions that he asked is, what's in it for you? If this is a twinning partnership, there has to be something in it for both partners. So we thought long and hard about that. Why would we do this uh, from our point of view? And as Deirdre has mentioned, one of the important things for us was the team building on our side. This has been a project that has helped to bring the different participants in the palliative care community here in Nanaimo together, uh, cooperating on a project. We have in our community three different groups that are involved with hospice and palliative care. And um, there's the people at the hospital in the palliative care unit. Then there's Nanaimo Community Hospice, which does a lot of grief counseling and providing of volunteers. And then there's the home care group. It was really a, a bridge building uh, endeavor uh, between our three groups in Nanaimo and then also uh, a bridge between the Nanaimo palliative care community and across the globe to back to Peru. And that kind of personal connection with people experiencing the same kinds of struggles that we have here is partly what attracted us to this twinning idea, this idea of, of partnering up with a different, with a program. I, I actually, I love seeing how much the families assist. To me, that is such a, um, a rare thing that you see in Canada. You, you get these families that you just think are the most amazing families in Canada where they do assist so much to the end of, of a family member's life but they're rare they don't happen very often so I love seeing how their families are so connected and caring for each other to me that's just it kind of sums up their society doesn't it they're so interconnected with re their religion and their large families and yeah it's such a, a tight-knit kind of community. So I hadn't done much traveling before and I had an understanding that culturally it all be different. But I got to see how different things can be, but also how interconnected things are as well. Like a lot of the problems that they talk about, we struggle with in Canada too. I just 
my I look at the world differently. I look at my work differently. It's a country that's in my heart. It really is. I um, I was very surprised at how how much this project has actually changed my life. Some of the other changes that um, we're expecting are just general awareness of palliative care and change in attitudes towards care of the dying, the transition between active care and palliative care. Um, it's easy for us to be unrealistic about that and expect major changes within a few years. They've only had oral morphine available for four or five years. It's only been reliably available for a couple of years. Attitudes towards palliative care have been slow to change here in the West. The first hospices and the first palliative care programs in England and North America happened in the late 1970s. And uh, things take years to change. It took decades for attitudes to change here. Mm -hmm. So it's not realistic for us to expect attitudes in Nepal to change within two or three or four years when it took us much longer here. Uh, palliative care is new to the country. The word itself, though it's known to the medical personnels, but this topic is hardly talked about. There are hardly any palliative care units or any setup, or we don't see any uh, hospital or any health professionals working in this sector. So th I see it as a completely new thing in our country. But now there is increased uh, talks about the palliative care has come into the country since a few years, maybe hardly two, three years. And now the people have realized its importance and people are working in this sector as well. And then financial crisis is the main problem. Uh, even though some family want the patient to have the total care and total symptom management, but, uh, the, but the financial and the economical uh, weakness of the family Make, uh, makes them to withdraw from the treatment. Of course, it's actually the uh, it's a government duty to provide this funding, but the government have different uh, priority areas. So they are uh, primarily for children and maternity uh, things they are taking care of, and other things, infectious disease control, all those things. So uh, cancer is not at presently not at a priority level for government, though it should have been. So I want to tell you that. Uh, means the government of Nepal is not stable, means the political stability uh, is not here in Nepal. Some doctors also not properly treating the, or not respecting the profession, not seeing profession that well. This, uh, so we have seen that, but not in all cases. But yeah. there's some, that trend is there, definitely that is there. And this has definitely uh, made 
the nursing professionals a uh, little bit lower um, uh, self esteem is is mm. decreased because of that yeah. and uh, they are less motivated to really uh, give any their point of view to the doctors palliative care is such an important part of oncology care and in fact part of all of medical care especially in resource poor countries patients with cancer in countries like nepal often present with very advanced disease disease that would be in fact incurable even here in North America or diseases that are so advanced that there aren't good treatments here at all. So the care of the patient, management of their symptoms is such an important aspect of care. And we're really working hard to get um, palliative care incorporated as part of the overall medical system there. We have given them so much information in mm -hmm. these last two weeks, but it'll be interesting to see what the carryover is. Yeah. Uh, very few uh, medical curriculum has some palliative care and that also in small chapters. It doesn't carry some marks and they don't have to read this for passing out the exam. These uh, graduates don't know how to use morphine, they don't know how to do, how to have good communications, they don't know for good symptom control and they think whatever they learned is good. So this is not coming out uh, in the, their practice. And the same people are growing up and becoming a senior and policy maker. And they think uh, whatever they are doing is correct and is adequate. But now things have a uh, different uh, imperative care setup. So now they, these people, are, the policy makers should understand the palliative care is the uh, right of the people and there is their duty to make it available. Home care is most important in palliative care, like uh, hospital-based palliative care. Unfortunately, uh, here we couldn't be started in home care. But our future plan is also start the home care. First, we establish our hospital-based palliative care. Understand? And then in future, we could be started in hospital-based palliative care. We want to see that these palliative care services grow throughout the country so that the service is available for the people at their doorstep. Presently, what's happening is this palliative care setup is available in few of the city. And the people from the villages and, and the far away, they have to come all the way. And even the situation is for, like for example, the drugs like morphine, not available throughout the country. I want to make sure that this kind of basic drugs, this kind of basic uh, uh, services are available to the doorstep of the patient. I think it would be nice to see the future go towards them starting to find their own ways of discovering the knowledge that they need to keep increasing palliative care and back to poor. We should have a palliative care team and expert who, who should lead the scene. So they themselves should be working in excellent condition. So they should have one. We should have one center of excellence in palliative care setup. If the only trainees are benefited, it doesn't make any sense. But if the patients are benefited and there is more coverage to providing service to the patient, then that will be worth. So we have to work closely and advocate the government to have a national policy in the country. So without government, we can't cannot work. And uh, I've gained the knowledge and the technical skills from this training and from this course and from this palliative ward where we have the clinical duties over there. And it has brought a positive changes in me so that I could further, further, hope for the uh, broadening of these services to throughout the Nepal. So with that, what we can do is Presently, we have a uh, healthcare delivery system which already existed. So that is uh, taking care of preventive health uh, setup for children and for women, for vaccination program, etc. So we already had one system which works from uh, tertiary care level to zonal level to uh, district, district level to village health level. So there are already the people who works for these uh, services. So we can utilize these uh, same services, same manpower who works up to the community level and we can train them to a certain extent about palliative care. Palliative care is an interesting choice for working in the, in the developing world. It's, to me, it's something that can be done without a lot of resources. It's not an expensive process. It doesn't require a lot of expensive equipment or training. With a simple set of inexpensive medications and a modest amount of training, 
we can make a big difference to a lot of people. I want to give you thank for your team and especially for you. Uh, and uh, if we, um, uh, if if you provide like this type of training for our this uh, hospitals and other things, then we feel better for Nepal. We're in this for um, the long haul, and we're we're hoping that uh, over time that that uh, uh, there will be a gradual shift in attitudes and and a gradual assimilation of some of these new ideas and that by the time we finished our next uh, three-year uh, commitment which will is two years from now that we'll be able to look back over the whole six years and say yeah there really has been um, an important uh, advance made that's going to make an important difference in people's lives. So. It also speaks though to the importance of continuity of uh, having, um, you know, introducing new people to the project from Canada, but importance of continuity with some of the uh, some of the ongoing, so it's n not starting from scratch each time. Being able to build capacity within the team from Canada in order to help build capacity in Nepal. Okay, I am very thankful to that uh, to this twinning project. Uh, firstly, we are we are benefited by this twinning project. Just we, uh, we, I mean to say that just Bhaktapur Cancer Hospital staff. But now, I think that other staff nurses and other doctors that they are getting sorry, they are getting a training now. They are also getting benefit from this. Last ten years, a lot of change has come, and uh, so this will take place one day, but it will take a little slow. It happens a little uh, slow. Our our hope has been that. Our experience in Bhaktapur would encourage other Canadian hospices to have partners as well so that, you know, rather than building and getting bigger, that we would just replicate. So uh, I want to say that such type of twinning project to be continued in future and we need your support and help in future too. And what I have come with that expectation, I have found it here and definitely when I go back, I'll have a lot of skills, capacities I can put on those patients. You know.